Hello, my beautiful PhD friends. So today we're gonna to talk about the things that make you a perfect PhD student. And I'm gonna share with you the maybe not so ethical hacks that you can use to make yourself appear like the PhD student that dreams are made of. If you're new to this channel, please remember to subscribe and hit that bell notification because I share with you all of the tips and tricks to make your PhD work for you. I can tell you the things that no one else can because I'm out of the system and I want you to benefit from the things that I've learned. All right, let's get over and have a look at these things that will make you seem like an ideal PhD student. Supervisors choose PhD students because they want to further their own career. There's really no two ways to put that. Um, academics essentially are on their own little pyramid scheme where they have to hire a load of PhD students to test and validate their ideas, come up with their own ideas, and then all of the citations and paperwork and stuff points to their success. So really, Becoming a good PhD student is not typically about making you successful. It's about making your supervisor look good as well as sort of like pushing all of your effort upwards and furthering your PhD supervisor's career. So in this video, I'm gonna share with you what the system, you know, the academic system likes about PhD students. And then I'm gonna share with you the kind of little unethical or ethical, I don't know, borderline kind of tricks that I used to do during my PhD student uh, candidature just to kind of like keep things looking as if I was, doing everything the system wanted me to do, um, whilst also sort of benefiting, you know, where I wanted to go in life. So uh, yeah, this is, I don't know if this is illegal or unethical, but it is what it is. And here's the first one. The first one is all about long hours in the lab. PhD supervisors absolutely love it when you're just there before them, there after them. You know, there's rumors of you, being there late at night, you know, doing midnight experiments, that kind of, you know, dedication to the PhD really sort of sets the good signals early on to the PhD supervisor that you're gonna be productive. And, you know, productive in terms of produce science that can be written up and makes them look good. Um, and obviously, you know, you don't necessarily owe your PhD supervisor anything. You know, it's a job, they're paying you, for the skills you've built up already in your undergraduate. So don't feel like you have to be there till like midnight or something. I know that a lot of cultures and a lot of labs sort of encourage people to be there during weekends and, and do insane amount of hours. But what I learned was that my PhD supervisors quite often used to have a regular time that they would come in. One of my PhD supervisors would be there at about 8.30. The other one wouldn't turn up till about 10 and I would see him walk down the hill. I'd be like, oh, you know, this is pretty late. So, you know, it depends on what your PhD supervisor's style is, but to make him feel like you're kind of dedicating your life to uh, this PhD, it's a couple of tricks. The first one is just get there before them. like five minutes before them. That's one thing I used to do is whenever I used to know or I used to track when they used to come in, I would just be in the lab, and I did this in my postdoc as well, I used to just be in the lab when they came in. So if they walked past the lab office door, I would just make sure that the door was open, they could see me in there doing work, and it doesn't matter if it's like five minutes or even 30 seconds before they turn up, um, they just, sort of see you there and go, ah, yes, this person's on it. And once you get that reputation early on, you can kind of, you know, not be seen later on in your PhD to be there as early, but that kind of, um, that rhetoric around your work ethic stays for a very long time. So uh, yeah, that's one thing is turn up just before them and make it seem like, you know, you've been there for a long time. You know, don't lie and be like, oh, I've been here for a long time, but it's just about planting the kind of little bits in there. Um, and the second thing is delay your email sends. This was a little trick that someone taught me once, which was getting your email and sending it and then like 
postponing the reply just until like 10 p.m. or 8 p.m. or whatever it is. And it just means that these academics, when they see, oh wow, okay, they're still working at like 8 or 9 p.m. But I, I was long gone. I was kind of, uh, you know, back at home having a lovely time with my partner and uh, an email would be sent automatically making it look like I was working till 10 o'clock. So this works with some supervisors, not with others, but hey, that worked. Give it a go. <laughs> okay, the second thing that I absolutely love is an inquisitive mind, someone that comes up with their own ideas. And you know, this isn't necessarily something you can fake, but what I used to do is set aside times where I would purposely just go through the latest literature or literature that um, you know I thought was a little bit left of field of what I was doing. And coming up with these ideas and reading regularly just means that your, your mind is able to put together these kind of ideas. And don't be afraid of reading papers outside of your field. I, you know, occasionally looked at papers that were just outside of my field to have a look at what techniques and conditions and things that they were building. So I was, so I could kind of be like, am I, can I incorporate this into my research in some way? And I think just by sort of like slowly sweeping in, because remember your supervisor has their bubble of knowledge and it's very tightly wrapped around their field of research. So just going outside of that just a little bit can make it seem like you're super inquisitive, which you are, but you have to set aside time for it. This isn't something that happens naturally. Um, just go out and, you know, just explore, just start exploring, go out, go out, look at other techniques, new things. Um, and yeah, like I said, just expand that bubble a little bit. And I think the system and uh, your supervisor will thank you for it. The third thing is a self driven PhD student. Now, it depends on what type of supervisor you have. If you have the ones that I mainly had, which was like, um, you know, go and we'll speak in two weeks time sort of supervisor, then being self-driven is so important because you just have to keep your own kind of consistency of research and writing and all that up. Um, if you've got a micromanager, PhD supervisor, you know, this doesn't work so well because they're just always in your face, in your office, telling you what to do, looking for results, wanting to connect all the time. And that isn't super ideal. Um, but being self-driven comes down to this essentially, which is just come to them with problems and a solution. Like it, would, it didn't often take me long to realize that academics, they're quite busy at least the ones I had, my supervisors, you know, they were trying to balance their own careers and the, the horrible nature of academia and the political stuff and trying to satisfy the university by getting grants. So to be honest with you, they didn't really like me coming to them with just problems. So what I always said was, I would go to them with a problem and a solution all the time, no matter what. Even if I couldn't really come up with a solution, I would have my best sort of guesses and then they would help refine it. Um, because it can, yeah, just make you look like you're self-driven, you're, you're solutions focused and uh, going to a meeting and knowing, you know, a problem and a solution just means that they will like you, they will, you know, see you as someone that will help further their career, someone who's got the interest in solving problems. Um, and you know, they do want to have their own little kind of say in it. But coming with a solution sets that solution up, you know, you, you've you're kind of on the front foot, because you've worked out how you're going to do this experiment, you can present it to them, um, you can present the solution, and then they just fine tune. Whereas, I found that with supervisors that if you go in there with no solution, you end up being a toy to their wild ideas and just thrown around and played about and, you know, try this, try that. But going in keeps you focused. It keeps them focused and it, it helps everyone move in the right direction because the last thing you want is a supervisor with a crazy idea that will never work, that will send you down a rabbit hole that may last six months, that will never go anywhere. So solutions focus makes you an ideal PhD student. Number four is papers. Oh, the magical peer-reviewed academic papers. Now, these things, you know, they're hard to create 
well, they should be if you're doing it properly. Um, but you know, there's all these things you can game the system, but don't uh, don't try to write papers before you're ready to write papers. And early on, what you can do, and this is a trick that is probably you know played a lot, is speak to someone, you know, another PhD student, and offer to to use your techniques on their thing. Say, oh, I'll put your pH, your um, samples through my atomic force microscope. And what that does is it sets up a collaboration. If that data ends up in a paper, then your name goes on it, your supervisor's name goes on it, even if they had nothing to do with it. Um, but it makes you look good in their eyes because their name's on a paper and they, you know, all of that stuff. Um, so early on, that's the trick you can use. Whereas later on, you know, producing papers and understanding that your career and your supervisor's career really depends on producing papers and getting grants, nothing else. So an ideal PA in the system's eyes, the academic system's eyes, is one that just pumps out the papers. Um, and this can be games, like I said. Uh, you can just, you know, get your whole group on a paper, no matter if they were involved or not. And look, everyone has done it. Everyone has done a little something to get on a paper. We, uh, in Published Perish or Podcast, the podcast that uh, I'm co-host of, go check that out, um, uh, we call it cheesing. Because at the end of the uh, order list, you've got the first author, who's normally the person who did all the work, the last author, who's their supervisor, and everyone in the middle is the cheese um, in the academic sandwich. It's not a bad thing, but getting your name on papers will just help. But it is important that you drive papers later on in your PhD career, because then it's kind of tit for tat. You know, like you'll put someone on your paper, uh, they'll put you on your paper, and it just starts that kind of snowball. Um, and yeah, look, it's a horrible thing to say, but papers really are the currency of academia. And it's just horrible to see the games that people play to get themselves on papers, but hey, that is the reality of it. Mm. Number five is great writing and communication skills. This is something, right? This is a really strange thing because as an academic, you are not rewarded for great communication skills directly. And so my startup, Verbalize.Science, I really struggled to kind of get any buy-in from scientists. And I completely understand it because when I look at it, they're not rewarded for having great communication skills. They're not rewarded for getting their knowledge, their PhD you know, results out into the broader public. It's just all about papers. And so communication skills is a secret weapon that you do have to work on yourself and that you will not be rewarded for directly. But a an ideal PhD student is someone who gives confidence to their audience through communication. Now, I wasn't a great PhD student, I wasn't a fantastic postdoc, but I stood out because I was good at communicating and good at talking to a group of people. It really is a secret weapon. I should do a video completely on this because even though PhD students and acad academics do not look to build their communication skills directly, they absolutely should. And I genuinely believe that without my strong communication skills, I would not have got as far as I did um, in academia, you know, with grants and my own students and um, yeah, just all of that stuff came because I gave confidence to my audience every time I spoke. I, I, I was animated, I was fun, but I got a story across. And an ideal PhD student has those skills and it's not something that's explicitly taught unfortunately. Now the thing is, is that you can take um, a PhD student and, and send them to conferences and so by having good communication skills the supervisor is confident that you'll be representing them in the best way possible because ultimately that's what it means to the supervisor is does this student, does this PhD student fill my peers with confidence? Are people going to be confident with them on stage? You know, all of that comes down to communication skills and an ideal PhD student has communication skills and trust me, it is like a secret weapon for the rest of your career. So do spend time trying to hone those skills, even if it makes you uncomfortable to speak in public, for example, because it just works. 
So there we have it. There are all of the things that will make you an ideal PhD student. And I hope that I've given you some skills that mean that you can sort of tick those boxes without sacrificing your goals. Um, so let me know in the comments what you would add to that list. And if this video has been helpful, please remember to subscribe, share, all of that stuff, because it really helps me grow the channel and I want to help as many people as possible through their PhD and make their PhD work for them. Okay, like I said, let me know in the comments what you would add to this list and I shall see you in the next video.